Welcome to Legal Toolkit, bringing you the latest legal trends and business initiatives to help you manage your law firm with your host, Jared Correa. You're listening to Legal Talk Network. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to yet another episode of the award-winning Legal Toolkit podcast only on the Legal Talk Network. If you were looking for Lion-O, I believe the Thundercats are streaming on Amazon Prime. Look there. If you're a returning listener, welcome back. If you're a first-time listener, welcome home. And if you're Pepper Brooks, you sure do like pumpkins. As always, I'm your show host, Jared Correa. And in addition to casting this pod, I'm the CEO of Red Cave Law Firm Consulting, which offers subscription-based law practice management consulting services for law firms, bar associations, and legal vendors. Check us out at redcavelegal.com. I'm also the COO of Gideon Software, Inc., which offers chatbot software built specifically for law firms. Find out more at www.gideon.legal. But here on the Legal Toolkit, we provide you with a new tool each episode to add to your own legal toolkit so that your practices will become more and more like best practices. In this episode, we're not just going to talk about the fact that lawyers are inefficient, but we're going to try to figure out why they're inefficient. But before I introduce today's guest, let's take a moment to thank our sponsors. We would like to thank Alert Communications for sponsoring this podcast. If any law firm is looking for call, intake, or retainer services available 24-7, 365, just call 866-827-5568. Scorpion is the leading provider of marketing solutions for the legal industry. With nearly 20 years of experience serving attorneys, Scorpion can help grow your practice. Learn more at scorpionlegal.com. Abby Connect has delivered premium live receptionist and answering services to lawyers since 2006. You can try them out for free at abbyconnect.com. TimeSolve is the number one web-based time and billing software for lawyers. Providing solutions since 1999, TimeSolve provides the most comprehensive billing features for law firms big and small. www.timesolve.com. So my guest today is Tucker Cottingham, who's the CEO and co-founder of LawYaw, which delivers document assembly for attorneys. Now, Tucker, that was a super brief bio. Anything you would like to add about you or LawYaw, now would be a good time to do so. Thanks, Jared. Well, thank you for having me. Yeah, as you said, LawYaw is built for law firms. And so maybe worth mentioning that I'm also a lawyer and spent several years practicing law and building a small firm myself. So I have some experience doing that before starting LawYaw. You got out. Good for you. <laughs> uh, welcome to the big show, Tucker. Thank you. I know we've been I appreciate trying. it. Have you ever, you, we've never done this before, have we? We have not we have. done this before. No, this is exciting. I'm thrilled. All right. I, so I need to get something off my chest first. You've got a pretty killer beard. I don't know if people know that about <laughs> you. And I don't know if it like comes off in the, in the audio recording, but hopefully we'll have a picture attached to this uh, podcast so people can actually see it in its full glory. <laughs> like you could have easily been a oh, general during the civil war. Like, I won't even front. So I've heard a rumor that you might be the fourth member of ZZ Top. <laughs> Can you confirm or deny? You know, usually usually people go with Brad Pitt from uh, Legend of the Fall, but uh, I'll take yeah. the ZZ Top compliment. <laughs> Brad Pitt's pretty good. I think I would probably go with Brad Pitt over like Billy <laughs> Gibbons, but I'll work on that. Next time we do the show, I'll have a better comp for you. There you go. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's make the sponsors happy. Let's talk about law stuff, right? So mm. you run LawYaw, which is a document assembly company. So you believe in efficiency. You kind of have to if that's yes. your business model. So let's talk first about why it's important for lawyers to be consistently efficient, especially now where everybody's working from home, uh, everybody's doing web-based marketing, everybody's doing things online. Can you talk a little bit about that? And then we'll dive into the reasons why lawyers are so inefficient. Yeah, sure. So you know, most lawyers who practice law for any amount of time, I think, have this feeling that there has to be a better way than how they're currently doing things, just generally. And I think a lot of times the word efficiency kind of gets melded with this sort of feeling of, you know, there has to be a better way to do things. And from my experience, that kind of falls into three categories. So I guess, you know, quality of life, I think, is is probably the main driver, honestly, and that touches on mm -hmm. some of the things you mentioned. But, you know, I personally really believe that as lawyers, our time is worth a lot more than just money. 
And so many of the attorneys and paralegals and staff that we talk with tell me that in order to keep up with their work, they're sacrificing all kinds of other things in their lives. So whether that's, you know, time with family or hobbies or health or other relationships. So I think that the biggest driver, I think, really is just quality of life. And then the second one is probably client expectations. And so as you've talked about, as you know, a lot of people have talked about, client expectations are changing dramatically. Um, <laughs> right. And clients no longer expect just you know, quality or personalization, they expect convenience. And that's what we're used to from basically every other area of our lives now. And so whether it's you know, shopping and getting groceries delivered or transportation or professional services, you know, I now communicate with my dentist by text and they remind me of meetings and ask me if I wanna reschedule and it's easy, it's amazing, mm-hmm. it's you know, super convenient. And, you know, I equate that with with sort of a luxurious kind of experience. And so, you know, I would say quality of life, client expectations, and, and then necessity. And kind of, as you mentioned, you know, I think COVID has really changed everything. And so many firms now just need to change how they've been doing business because, you know, it's a lot harder to meet with clients or collaborate with coworkers and so forth. And in some ways, a lot of us have more time because we're commuting less and traveling and networking less. But we have all these new demands on our time as well. So, you know, for for folks that have kids, especially for folks that have kids, uh, you know, navigating school year starting and social events and all these things during the day that that are sort of in our lives now on a regular basis. So, yeah, I would say that, you know, some of the, the drivers that we're seeing, you know, our quality of life is probably the primary and then client expectations and, and just necessity. Are you going to social events that I'm unaware of? I don't think I've gone to a social <laughs> event with more than like four people in half a year. <laughs> no, but I, I'm getting people that want to schedule like Zoom calls during the day, you know, <laughs> things like that. You know, I think it's I think it's great that you bring up like the lifestyle side of a law practice because I think all these studies that come out, like you look at everything about lawyers, and it's like their number one concern is revenue across the mm-hmm. board, and. I think that there are actually a lot of lawyers out there who want to be able to practice in a way that's comfortable for them and their families. And the education on technology is really important for that. We all want to go and design Minecraft buildings after we podcast, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I mean, I think I think that's true, though, to a degree. A lot of the firms that we, we talk with, a lot of the attorneys I talk with, you know, when they're not sort of being on the record, you know, have all kinds of opinions about their quality of life and the right. lifestyle they want to live. Right. I mean, you know, we'll talk about it later, but you know, there's essential human things that are not, we're not immune to as attorneys. Totally true. And like, you make a good point about people with kids, right? Like I know that my schedule has been deeply affected by the fact that I'm like the babysitter, caregiver, right. teacher, like it's hard to manage all that stuff. And the business expectations that like you just soldier on and do your stuff. But like mm-hmm. having some more time to be able to do that, being hyper efficient is really helpful. All right. So let's talk about the root cause of inefficiency for lawyers, because I think you have a really interesting take on this. And when most people talk about lawyers, they're like, well, of course, lawyers are inefficient, right? But people don't often say like, why they think that's the case. So why do you think that's the case? Yeah, this is this is something that kind of recently clicked for me. You know, people who are not in the business of providing legal services think that lawyers are inefficient because we make more money that way, right? Um, <laughs> and they think it's all this like big calculated scheme to make you know more money from our clients. Yeah. And when this really hit home for me, we were raising our first round of funding, and an investor said to me, "You know, lawyers don't care how they spend their time. A lawyer, you know, would scrub a bathroom with a toothbrush for three hundred dollars an hour." <laughs> And I was deeply offended and yeah. shocked. <laughs> yeah. And uh, but partly just because people think that lawyers are just totally different than other people, but more so that you know this idea that our only sense of satisfaction is from the money. It's kind of what you talked about. And so that kind of set me into okay, you know, digging into this issue a little bit more deeply and trying to really understand some of these hard problems of of you know what the origins of some of these very manual kind of archaic processes are in the legal industry. And the, the brief answer is that legal inefficiencies, you know, I think are often rooted in a desire to build strong relationships and really client stewardship. And I think that's the origin of a lot of these sort of manual processes that now we're seeing, you know, sort of stand out in an age where everything is so much more efficient. I hear that a lot from lawyers, and that's a good point that you make. Like any time you talk to a quote unquote traditional lawyer about using technology. They're like, well, I want to keep touches on clients, right? And mm-hmm. they think that means mm-hmm. they need to talk to them 
or there right. needs to be a manual process to manage the interaction. And they feel like if there's any kind of barrier between them and their clients, they're going to lose the client eventually, or new clients aren't going to come in. Um, I think that's right. especially true in like small firm practices. So this notion of like client stewardship affecting the way lawyers work, I think is really spot on. So do you want to expand on that a little bit? Yeah, sure. And, and I think it's a super important part of the conversation that gets left out from a lot of the discussions about legal technology, which is that people are hiring lawyers to help them with really important things, right? Custody mm -hmm. of, of our kids and how to distribute the property you spent your entire life accumulating and, you know, lawsuits and employment issues and immigration, and all these things that are oftentimes life changing events for the people who are who are hiring lawyers or looking to hire lawyers. And they're really stressful and distracting. And so this human element of hiring a real person that has experience that you trust is very genuinely critical to a successful relationship, I think. But I think when you look at, at some of these processes, it can kind of come into focus a little bit differently. And so an example would be prospective client intake is one that I, I like thinking about. You know, so sort of before somebody's hired a lawyer. And I like this example because lawyers aren't getting paid for time before they're retained, right? So this right. is not, they don't have the economic incentive to be inefficient that, uh, going back to our investor comment, but most attorneys understand that the initial relationship building, you know, that step of building trust is really important. And so the vast majority of attorneys spend time talking with prospective clients and, and then manually taking notes. And, you know, there are more efficient ways to screen clients and collect information, but the tradition of meeting and talking and you know taking notes comes, I think, from this inherent desire to build a personal relationship and to earn trust, and then in turn to to win that business. And so I think you know the the punchline for me is really just that when we're thinking and talking about technology and process improvement, we can't ignore that human element. I think it's very foundational to attorney client relationships and to to running a successful law practice. And there may be other ways that we can improve. There, I think that there's an opportunity to improve legal process and to leverage technology without ignoring or trying to uh, minimize the importance of personal relationships and the importance of earning trust. But there are just a lot more ways to build personal relationships and to earn trust now than through these sort of manual processes that, that may not even be the thing that the clients are, are really looking for, if that makes sense. Totally. That's great. So we'll stop here for the first part of the show. We'll take a break. You'll hear from our sponsors. And then we're going to come back and talk about applying efficiencies in the law office. Imagine billing day being the happiest day of the month instead of the day you dread. Nobody went to law school because they love drafting invoices for clients. At TimeSolve, our attorneys save on average over eight hours a month in billing work. That means more billable time and turning billing day into happy day. Learn more about how to get to your time and billing happy place at timesolve.com. That's www.timesolv, leave off the e, dot com. Remember, that's T-I-M-E-S-O-L-V dot com. Your legal work requires your full attention. So how can you build lasting relationships with new or existing clients while juggling your caseload? Try Abby Connect the friendly, highly trained, and motivated live receptionists who are well-known for providing consistent quality customer service and support to law firms just like yours. Every connection matters. So call Abby Connect today at 833-ABBY-WOW to get started with your free 14-day trial and $95 off your first bill. All right, thanks for coming back. I've returned from putting down an entire package of refrigerated Sather's gummy worms. By the way, those are the best <laughs> gummy worms in the world. I'm not even being paid for this. So let's get back to our conversation with Tucker Cottingham of Law Yaw, and we're talking about curing law firm efficiencies. All right, so we talked about lawyers and efficiencies. We talked about why they're inefficient. But you and I both know that one of the best ways to add efficiency to a law firm, maybe the easiest way, is to utilize a document automation tool. I think traditionally it's been really hard for law firms to find document automation tools that are viable in the cloud. So is that changing? Has that changed? Ha, huh, yeah. The world is changing. It is much easier to find, you know, user-friendly cloud-based document efficiency solutions, LawYaw obviously being one of them. Mm -hmm. But to your point, that's that's actually why I started LawYaw is because at our firm we wanted that kind of a solution. We couldn't find one. And it was 
mind blowing to me that in 2016, this didn't exist. Um, <laughs> the holes in legal it, technology are still staggering to me, but go on. It just really foundational stuff, right? Like we, we were getting good business. We had, you know, and the firm still around and has great reputation, but there were just a lot of things that we didn't need to manually be doing. And I think that at the surface, it seemed like that was an obvious, there was an obvious solution to an obvious problem. I think one of the reasons it's taken a lot longer to really become easily available is because of the technology itself. So, you know, thinking about sort of some of the things that have changed in the, in the past, there were really kind of like two main types of document automation. So one was sort of the old non-cloud-based world of, of programming languages. Mm-hmm. So this actually required, you know, writing logic statements into your documents. And so, you know, that's kind of the old, you know, process of super slow, kind of tedious 800-page manuals <laughs> with, you know, tons of user instructions for how you create, you know, an if-then statement, you know. Right. And for people looking for efficiency, that doesn't seem like an obvious path to, to learn a new programming language and read an 800-page manual. And then the second is this sort of like, clunky use of custom fields and kind of usually inside of your practice management software. And then really you're kind of trying to manage like a million different custom fields and do these like mail merges and keep them organized. And it's just a very clunky, you know, unfulfilling process, which for folks that have tried it really quickly hits a ceiling when it comes to anything, you know, more complicated than a simple letter. And so, yeah, so I think that the, the world has changed in the way that now we have, you know, more affordable cloud-based uh, storage online. A lot of the trends that have enabled other technologies enabled document automation, but essentially being able to have an infrastructure that's cloud-based, that's more affordable, and that, you know, we can do things with data and language now that makes it easier for an end user to, you don't have to memorize these specific kind of logic statements. We can do things to make that a lot more user-friendly. Right, and I think that's kind of the story of legal technology writ large, right? As, as the cloud came on, software became much more convenient, much more easy to use, and then like you're not dealing with legacy or on-premise systems as much anymore, or at least you have a choice to move off of those. Right. So one thing you talked about in that response that you just gave was like the changes with respect to the cloud have also generated changes in terms of like the user interface that's utilized in a document assembly program. So can you speak a little bit more about how those changes have been effectuated? Yeah, sure. So now, you know, so I kind of gave examples of sort of some of the old processes, which is sort of a glorified mail merge inside of another software or kind of a really complex sort of programming language style, non-cloud-based program. And now you can have, you know, simple interfaces with, you know, clickable buttons, you know, drag and drop, you know, just select the text that needs to become changeable. And we can use kind of more generalized notions of of these fields. So like an attorney's first name or the number of kids that a client has, you know, they're not just mail merge tags, but they actually allow you to do something that's a little bit more substantive. And so that then for for other documents in that given case or that client, you know, you can combine different documents and you can change the number of kids and that'll change multiple documents and adjust things like subject verb agreement or pronouns or drop in sections of text. But the interface of just being more kind of what people are used to really opens up, you know, a whole world of building these workflows and doing it in a way that doesn't hit that low ceiling of a mail merge, but being able to generate, you know, an entire divorce packet or an estate plan and reusing a lot of what you already have. So I would say that kind of a tangential benefit to the user interface kind of issue is that it also allows you to use your own documents because it used to be so complicated to turn your own documents into sort of smart templates or these kind of programmable things that people started just using default templates. Like, okay, off the shelf, here's a bunch of canned letters or here's a bunch of canned, you know, motions or estate documents, whatever it may be. And a large part of that was because turning your own documents into templates was really hard. So what, what the advances in user interfaces have done by simplifying them is it makes a lot more of the work that you know, attorneys have already spent a decade putting together, you know, useful and accessible. So I would say that that's one of the most exciting things that we're seeing is the number of firms that are able to say, oh yeah, we've got another version of this that we did for a previous client. We can just turn that into a template and we send out the same, you know, proof of services and letters and petitions that we've, you know, for each case they're, they're different, but we can reuse all this stuff we've been doing and really make that pretty quickly make that into a streamlined kind of document workflow. And so that's where I see 
you know, it's interesting that you asked about the UI because I really see that as an inflection point in enabling, you know, a really powerful use of, of this kind of technology for small firms. Oh, totally. Like, I quit practicing law for a reason. And ser- <laughs> seriously, like, one of the reasons was like, I'm like, my God, no one knows how to use technology in this field. I'm going to be mm-hmm. sitting in an office 16 hours a day because the people right. I'm working with are just like, they don't know what they're doing here. Guys, right, so let's let's have one more question covered on this topic, which is integrations, right? Like mm-hmm. the cloud also allows technologies to work together better than they ever have before. So what kind of integrations are you seeing in the world of document assembly that are hot right now? Yeah, and I think one of the things that we've learned over the last, you know, 15 years of, of legal technology is that, you know, the promise of this amazing all-in-one solution is not realistic. I keep hearing about that. Supposed to be happening. <laughs> I just, I, I'm not a believer, unfortunately. I think it's very unlikely that a legal research company would also happen to make the best billing software or that a video <laughs> conferencing tool is going to make your best calendar solution, you know. Fair point. And so, you know, it's just not their core competence. It requires different different skills to build different things. And so, you know, luckily the the internet, again, has helped us because now we can have these best in class solutions for different specific things that can work well together. And to your point, we do that with, with integrations. And so, you know, at Lawyer, our goal is really to seamlessly integrate with all these other things that you're using and for us to be the very best at what we do, which is streamlining your document workflows. And so, the types of integrations that we're seeing, you know, now are with your practice management software, not having to retype things into your billing software that you're using in your documents, maybe intake forms or chatbots, you know, where maybe you do do some pre-screening or you do have some kind of intake or receptionist service and essentially letting that information flow, you know, through your different processes without having to retype it into all these systems. And so that's something we've been, you know, really kind of focused on from day one, but we're seeing gaining a lot of traction right now is people just want these things to work nicely together. And they know that one company isn't necessarily going to build the best version of 20 different tools. And so <laughs> I think having these, you know, these APIs and these integrations are, are really critical to the future of, of law in general. Now that you've destroyed the dream of a single legal software, let's take a break <laughs> so everybody can recover from that. Listen to some more words from our sponsors, and we'll be back for our last and final segment. Now more than ever, an effective marketing strategy is one of the most important things your law firm can have, and Scorpion can help. With nearly 20 years of experience serving the legal industry, Scorpion has proven methods to help you get the high-value cases you deserve. Join thousands of attorneys across the country who have turned to Scorpion for effective marketing and technology solutions. For a better way to grow your practice, visit scorpionlegal.com. As the largest legal-only call center in the U.S., Alert Communications helps law firms and legal marketing agencies with new client intake. Alert captures and responds to all leads 24-7, 365 as an extension of your firm in both Spanish and English. Alert uses proven intake methods, customizing responses as needed, which earns the trust of clients and improves client retention. To find out how Alert can help your law office, call 866-827-5568 or visit alertcommunications.com slash LTN. All right, thanks for staying with us. I never left. Now let's continue with Tucker Cottingham of Law Yaw, who's been walking us through why it is that lawyers are just so damn inefficient. For this last part of the show, we're going to do a little bit of grab bag questions. This is the potpourri section of the podcast. (laughs) So Tucker, do you find that the efficient lawyers that you know, work with, talk to, are tending to build differently? than other attorneys. By that, I mean like not hourly billing, but trying different things. Like alternative fee structures and flat rate and things like that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the short answer is yes. For everything, maybe except for litigation defense, which Mm. sort of has its own evolution in billing conventions. But yeah, I mean, I think in general, many practice areas are really well suited to non-hourly billing. Um, So family law, estate planning, housing, immigration, personal injury, consumer finance, right? And so I'd say that lately we've definitely seen a big trend in returning to those kind of fee schedules. And maybe an interesting point here for, for the audience is sort of the some of the history of the billable hour 
I don't know if you've spent too much time going into that in the past, but not weekend reading for me, no. But go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Well, the the history of the Billable Hour is actually super interesting, I think. But up until the 1970s, the Billable Hour was almost non-existent, and so state bar associations would set a fixed rate fee schedule for most legal services. And then it wasn't until 1975 that there was a Supreme Court ruling in, I think, Goldfarb v. Virginia, where the, the court essentially said that setting a minimum fee schedule was anti-competitive and constituted price fixing. And so, you know, after that, there had to be a way to distinguish the pricing for different services. And the billable hour became an easy way to create, you know, obvious pricing competition. And so oftentimes people think that legal services have always been hourly, and now there's this innovative new approach to create some sort of alternative fee arrangements, but really it was always alternative fee arrangements. <laughs> yeah. And then there was a antitrust lawsuit that sort of resulted in a really quick conversion to a lot of billable rates, hourly billing. And now we're seeing, you know, the same practice areas go back towards some of those different fee structures, which they really naturally fit into. And I'm, I'm always interested when I talk to firms, they say, oh, you could never do this on a flat rate. Our cases are always different. It's like, oh, well, man. for you know, 200 yeah. years, they, they did. <laughs> <laughs> so, but we do see people that have, what I would say is that you do want to have some kind of economic incentive for efficiency in some way. I do think that despite our earlier conversation, I do think that that's helpful. And yeah. so things like fixed fee or capped billing or um, you know contingency. And then what we see too with a lot of our, our customers is they might do a hybrid approach. So it doesn't need to be that the entire the entire project can be flat rate. You might say we do flat rate up until this point, or we do flat rate for projects that these certain facts are not present in, you know, that make them more complicated. So I think having a, a sort of a, a fluid understanding of that or having that as a tool in your legal toolkit to Oh wow, uh, well played. You. Well hey, thank played. you, right? Bonus points. <laughs> <laughs> now if we can just bring the pet rock back, we'll be all set. <laughs> Alternative fees, pet rocks. Right. Exactly. It's all been done. But no, yeah, I mean, I, th I think to your point, you know, what document efficiency enables is having a more predictable amount of time and resources for a project. And being able to know that with some degree of certainty enables you to, to really, you know, have a lot um, more predictable pricing, which is better for clients and better for law firms. So we absolutely see that as a trend across our customer base. No question. We've talked a lot about inefficiency for lawyers who are in practice for profit. How about legal aid attorneys? Do you work with legal aid providers and how do they work in terms of technology and efficiency versus kind of like the for-profit law firm model? Yeah, that's a super interesting and good question. We do. We work with a lot of legal aid organizations. We work with a lot of LSC funded organizations. We have all over the country, different legal aids using us. And we've been doing that really since the beginning of law, y'all. It would be an interesting conversation for another time, but that was really our roots are in working with legal aid, although it's not not widely talked about by us or, or other folks. But yeah, you know, there there is this huge issue of all of the kind of access to justice and all of the sort of barriers that prevent most saying that as a scientific term that prevent you know, most people from being able <laughs> yes, to yes. access uh, legal services. I won't require data from you, sir. Go on. <laughs> There's a California access to justice report I'll put you in touch with. Um, <laughs> but but no, it's it's they're very incentivized to help as many people as possible without sacrificing quality. And so, you know, in our experience, they are very motivated to try to help as many people as possible and be efficient. Now that's not saying that all legal aid organizations are super technology savvy or that mm -hmm. the people that work there are really even interested in technology. But I do think that they're aligned with wanting to be able to increase access to legal services. And so, you know, again, kind of having convenient and user friendly ways to do that is really a huge, a hugely powerful benefit for, for legal aid and, and for society. And I'll sort of spare you that part of things. But yeah, I think it's really critical. And we definitely have seen a ton of legal aid organizations coming through to law, especially since COVID. Well, that's a good segue to another question I wanted to ask you. Like, we're, we're, this pandemic is still ongoing, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody's mm -hmm. talking about it all the time to the point where it's nauseating. So right. like, in terms of legal technology, like, are you seeing now, like the last five months, law firms really diving in and adopting technology? Or are they just turtling and they're like in shock and they don't know what to do? What's been your experience? 
No, definitely diving in. I think, you know, we, we will almost double in size in the next few months. Nice. So yeah, it's been, it's been a huge influx of people wanting to get their systems in place, whether that's because they have time now because there were court closures or whether that's because, you know, right. they want to tighten their belt and they need to kind of, you know, fortify, or in some cases they want to grow and kind of use this, this technology as a growth mechanism. But we're seeing a, a huge amount of, of increase. And a lot of times it's stuff that people have been wanting to do forever, like saying like a very common conversation I have is some, you know, attorney says, this is something that's been on our radar for a long time. We've, we've known we wanted to do this. We just have never really had the time to do it or enough motivation. And now it makes sense. So I think that I do think that right now is a, a really interesting kind of inflection point for the legal industry, especially for small firm attorneys and, and small firm organizations because there are really practical solutions to allow them to, you know, collaborate remotely and to, uh, you know, make their services more accessible and to, you know, do all these standardize their brand when you're not in the same room as somebody, but you know that everything that's coming out the door is consistent because you're using the same templates and you know exactly what's changing the documents. You can easily see what's changed. So I think that I'm seeing, well, I definitely am seeing a, a huge increase in interest towards a lot of the technology. But I'll say that I think a lot of the motivation is around efficiencies that sort of always made sense, but now seems to be um, <laughs> right. a particularly motivating time as opposed to, I'd never thought about this before and now it's going off in my, you know. Um, True. So I don't, I don't know how many new, and I just don't know the answer to this, it may be a lot, but I don't know how many totally new attorneys are thinking about technology for the first time as much as, okay, now I've, now I've actually got to act on this. And, you know, we're seeing, we're seeing those things happen. And I think when you referenced tightening your belt before, that must have been a figurative metaphor and not a literal one. I don't think anyone's <laughs> tightening belts. I think I had like five scones before I came into this podcast, <laughs> just because I sit at home and eat all the time. Right. So I complimented your beard earlier. So may I also say okay. that you've got a pretty sweet name as well. Like my kids oh, hate you. my last name. Because it's got more vowels and consonants. And they're like, we can't even spell our name. And my wife's last name is Foster. So they're like, yeah. you should just take in mom's name when you get married. And I'm like, that's not traditionally how it's done, but I like how you're thinking outside <laughs> the box. Um, right. yeah, they're always on the new frontier. Yeah, yeah. I feel like y you probably are a knight or a lord somewhere in your family's history, <laughs> right? So like, let's shift topics entirely and like, tell me Game of Thrones last season. Oh. How would you rate it on a scale of one to 10? Feel free to go into negative numbers if you want. You know, I I was disappointed when I was watching it. I'll say that. But <laughs> but 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 upon reflection, I liked I liked more of it than uh, than I did in the moment. Oh, all right. So I'm not I'm not as negative. Like if you would have talked to me, and maybe it's just the whole you know pandemic where now it seems like a new episode of Game of Thrones would be so exciting uh, <laughs> that I have more appreciation for it. But uh, I'm not as negative as as some people were. I thought the CGI could have been a little better at points, but, mm -hmm. you know. Time heals all wounds, my friend. All right. <laughs> yeah. We've reached the end of yet another episode of the old Legal Toolkit podcast. This is the one where we talked about the inefficiency of legal processes, and we've been chatting with Tucker Cottingham of Law Yaw. Now, I'll be back on future shows, shows with further insights into my soul, the soul of America, or what's left of it, and the legal market. If you're feeling nostalgic for my dulcet tones, however, you can check out our entire show archive anytime you want at LegalTalkNetwork.com. So thanks again to Tucker Cottingham of Law Yaw for making an appearance as my guest today. Uh, Tucker, can you tell every oh this is this is a lot of fun. Tucker, can you tell everyone how they can find out more about you and about Laya? Absolutely. Thank you again for for having me. This was great. And if you want to learn more about Laya, you can go to www.lawya.com. That's L A W Y A W dot com. And we have uh, ways to get in touch with us there. You can chat us or send us an email from the website. That's gonna be your best bet. Check them out. I'm sure Tucker also has a Game of Thrones blog out there somewhere. <laughs> or I bet if you dig, you can find it. Um, so thanks again. Tucker Cottingham of Law Yaw was my guest today. Finally, thanks to all you out there for listening. Uh, this has been the Legal Toolkit Podcast, where the red wedding never happened. Thanks for listening to Legal Toolkit, produced by the broadcast professionals at Legal Talk Network. Join host Jared Correa for his next podcast covering the current business trends for law firms. If you'd like more information about today's show, please visit LegalTalkNetwork.com. Subscribe via iTunes and RSS. 
Find Legal Talk Network on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Or download the free app from Legal Talk Network in Google Play and iTunes. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of, nor are they endorsed by, Legal Talk Network, its officers, directors, employees, agents, representatives, shareholders, and subsidiaries. None of the content should be considered legal advice. As always, consult a lawyer.